we invited various aspects of people, including our dear students, including our other stakeholders, and here we are. So do not say we are fewer in the hall. We are internationally being followed up by Father Charles' efforts and the efforts of other stakeholders. And therefore, for us, we usually go on time. It's five minutes past two, and our event was supposed to begin at exactly two. And our simple program is, we will begin with prayer. The University of St. Joseph is a Catholic-founded university, and therefore we cannot do anything if we do not, if we do not, if we do not use the player. Player is the best tool for us, and therefore we think we shall begin with player. And without wasting time, we are going to request our dear sister, Dr. Priska, to lead us in the opening player. So if you get prepared, when we give you the microphone, you lead us in the prayer of today. After that, we shall have opening remarks or introductions by our dear Vice Chancellor, and he'll be telling us actually who is the speaker of today. And then after that, I wish to note that when somebody of that caliber, the one who is going to be introduced, we always give an ovation stand in order to realize whether the words said are good. So after that, we shall have a presentation. He came with a very big gift and we, will, we shall request one of our deans called Rose Mary to receive those gifts and hand them over to Sister Priska who is in charge of that good gift because it is on business studies. Then we shall engage. We call it a discussion. We shall try to engage you, to ask you the pedagogy of what you have taught us and then the philosopher and so on. And then after, we'll make it a day and closure and then we shall request one of us to give a closing prayer. Now, without wasting time, we, we are going to request Sister Dr. Priska to come and lead us in the opening prayer. The microphone is here. We are here in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, O oh God our Father. We thank you for this afternoon. We thank you for our university. We thank you for bringing us here safely. We thank you for our very existence. And we thank you for our students and all those who are attached to us. Father. We ask you, send us the Holy Spirit to guide us so that we can be furnished with the information that will help us to serve you better wherever we are, for the good of our university, for the good of, our, of ourselves, and for the good of our country. Enlighten our facilitator so that this public lecture may not only be benefit us, but also may benefit, benefit those who are hearing us on the air. And after this lecture, let us all go outside there, proclaim the gospel about education, entrepreneurship, 
and employment. We ask this through Christ our Lord, Saint Joseph, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, sister. We, I was trying to get uh, taken by advice. So where the microphones are, they will stay. Because we are trying to stream live. So we wish to apologize. When we invite you to make a, a presentation, we shall direct you where you will be. Now, right away, we've got the prayer. So we are inviting our dear Vice Chancellor by the names of Reverend Father Dr. Max, Mark Deus, Karen to come and give an opening and then you tell us who is going to give a speech. Thank you, our moderator. On behalf of the University of St. Joseph Mbarara, I take this opportunity to welcome you all to today's public lecture by Professor Victor Murinde. Professor, you are most welcome. This public lecture is one of the activities that has been organized for the graduation week of the University of St. Joseph, which, which will culminate on Saturday with the graduation day. The theme of this public lecture is education, entrepreneurship, and employment. Who is Professor Victor Mrinde? Professor Victor Mrinde is a Ugandan by nationality, born in the present district of Untungamo. He holds the AXL Chair in Global Finance and is the founding director of the Research Center for Global Finance at the School of Finance and Management, SOS University of London. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. He is also a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences. He has contributed over 100 research papers, mainly in the banking and finance. According to the UK Research Excellence Framework, he is a research on shaping bank regulatory reforms in Africa, was recognized for exceptional impact. He is the principal investigator of a DFID ESRC research grant on inclusive France from 2016 to 2021, leading a consortium of, of SOS University of London, University of Birmingham, Columbia University, University of, Sus of Sussex, University of Nottingham, Old London, University of Groningen, Laval University, University of Ghana, Legion, and the African Economic Research Consortium. His other roles include Chair of Group C in Finance for the AERC, Council Member of British Institute in East Af Eastern Africa, and Visiting Professor of Financial Economics at the School of Economics, University of London, University of Nairobi. He was chair Econometric Society Africa Region Standing Committee from 2014 to 2020. Also, he was the founding director of the African Development Institute at the African Development Bank from 19 from 2021, 2011 to 2014. So you are most welcome, Professor Victor to this public lecture. Our audience is mainly composed of graduates of the University of St. Joseph, 
staff, students, businessmen and women, entrepreneurs, professionals, politicians, academicians, and what have you. It is on air and online. The number of people would have come to attend that preferred to remain in the comfort of their offices just to attend the lecture online. We are confident that we shall gain a lot in today's public lecture. You are most welcome, Professor Victor Mrindi. Thank you for listening to me. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, graduates, those that are pioneer celebrating this great achievement of the university. Uh, greetings. Let me say that this is uh, a great honor for me to deliver the uh, guest public lecture for the pioneer graduation ceremony of the University of St. Joseph Mbarara. And indeed, uh, one of the uh, honored positions I hold is of the visiting professor at this university, uh, which uh, is indeed a great honor. And today, I have this humble occasion. And let me start to say that uh, when I was invited to give this guest lecture, a, a professor um, and uh, Father Patrick Mbiamire uh, um, contacted me and sent me um, a letter of the invitation. And immediately, in my mind, I thought, okay, I'm gonna speak about the research I'm doing right now, and especially some of the key areas and controversies uh, in banking and finance, the threat of COVID-19 and the global economy, the role of China in taking over leadership of global economies and financial markets, the issue of financial inclusion to the exclusion of governments, especially from Africa, from the capital markets, the threat of climate risk and how it is disrupting global markets, the fintech revolution, and how in the next 10 years, banking will be as you have never imagined because of the role of technology. This was me thinking on the supply side, what I could offer. But actually, uh, Father Patrick came up with this idea of say, we will be talking to uh, graduates. We'll be talking to uh, the community of the university. And the key important question today is about education, entrepreneurship, and employment, which I call the three E's, because they, 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 they're all of the um, education, entrepreneurship, and the employment or jobs. And in particular, the way we understand the mechanisms that link education to entrepreneurship and to jobs. What should be done at the country level, at the institutional level, at the university level, and at the individual level and national level, for policymakers, regional level, and even global level. But there is something particular about this, uh, this uh, uh, workshop or uh, meeting today. I just confess that for more than two years, since March 2020, I have never been able to address a live audience. This is the first one since March 2020. Of course, I do meetings 
every week I convene an international group on Wednesday of every week. It's all virtual online using Teams and Zoom. But this hybrid one is a blessing for me because A, yes, I have never been able to visit my office in London. I work from home. So wake up, put on a jacket, a tie. I don't, I'm not sure whether I have a full suit, but there's no need. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this has been a great occasion to actually face-to-face -face interact with the people, talk to them, and I'm looking forward to enjoying this fellowship of exchange of ideas. So while I talk, feel free to be interactive and maybe comment or ask a question, interact with me, otherwise I will have this uh, um, uh, just uh, like a monologue talking uh, for the next five hours, right? Five hours? Yeah, yeah. okay, three, okay, okay. I wish it was five, okay. <laughs> so, 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 this work that I'm going to talk about, in other words, how I have imagined these ideas, comes from collaboration with so many people around the world. And I think I've been blessed, and I think the players of the diocese people and all the friends have helped me in many ways, uh, because there are breakthroughs that I make when I don't even anticipate them. So my work is funded by all these organizations which are listed here. Uh, I can see the AXA Research Fund, which has availed me phenomenal amount of resources to do my work, I put together a team in London that makes about 20 people to work with the uh, governments. I'm working with the Vice President of Ghana, for example, working with the Finance Minister of Seychelles, and also a, a working with the uh, Governor of uh, Central Bank of Kenya, a, and also working with the Governor of the Central Bank of Lesotho, all from this uh, work and also the um, Economic Social Research Council of the, of the UK, which funds quite a huge amount of work, and also the FCDO. So I thank them, uh, because without their support, I would not be able to be here. So I just want to share that some insight about these three is. And what I present here now is the roadmap. How we're gonna go is a cascade, uh, through the valleys, the mountains, the terrains, the corners. So I will proceed by, by first looking at what the relationships among the three is, how they interact. This is for social media. Um, um, of this uh, um, uh, lecture, um, I will explain the relationships among um, education, entrepreneurship, and jobs. I will also uh, look at the theoretical background. As a researcher, I invoke theory. Sometimes I build a beautiful theory, which is then assassinated by ugly facts. When I subject to testing, I find a beautiful theory does not meet reality and they destroy it again. So I look at this theory of understanding 
the role that education plays. This is fundamental among most economists, the way they understand education. I then uh, look at the state of entrepreneurship around the world. I then look at the feasible model that uh, links uh, entrepreneurship, activity, and economic growth, or economic prosperity. The employment status, which is a big challenge globally, especially after COVID-19. I then look at uh, home, I come back home after traversing the global terrain of this phenomenon. I then come back home and look at what's happening in Uganda, the status quo. And then I will end up with considering aspects of policy and practice. Policy is for policymakers, for public policy, for governments and other institutions. Practice is for companies and uh, institutions like Universal St. Jo Joseph Mbarara. And also the practice of individuals, you and I, the households in terms of how we should react, the takeaways that we can get from this uh, public lecture. So that's how I'm going to proceed. That's the roadmap. So first I want to look at something that seems, it's seemingly simple, but not necessarily simple. The way the three E's are linked, the interlinkages among education, entrepreneurship, and employment. So yes, you've got your degree. One degree, two degrees, three degrees, does it matter? And in this triangle, the relationship is that the acquisition of these degrees mean that you have the ability, entrepreneurial ability, to kickstart businesses or any activity, to have innovation. Does the acquisition of education mean that you can get jobs? So we look at the kind of triangular relationship between education and entrepreneurship. And whether, whether really you have the quantum, the more education you get, the more entrepreneur you become. Or is it possible, okay, maybe like Bill Gates, that you could easily move out of education without a complete education, but still become very much entrepreneur? Some people argue about psychological factors and culture and other issues. Okay. Now, how about how to rate the jobs? But really, does a triangular relationship help of trying to understand this? Maybe, maybe not, as we shall find out. Because it may well be the case that the relationship is actually based on the bivariates two-dimensional uh, relationships whereby education leads to jobs okay, and the jobs also enable you to get more education. Education leads to jobs because at every stage of the educational ladder, we in economics, we work with a value called the return to education because the education is an investment. Okay, how much your parents have been investing in you, how much St. Joseph Marie has been investing in you, and how much you in, also invest in your education time-wise. Okay. I guess that all these uh, young ladies and gentlemen have been reading 24-7. Uh, we all read 24-7 for, for different purposes. I read 24-7 to keep my job, you read 24-7 to get your degree. <laughs> but we all read 24-7. And so that education leading to jobs but the understanding that as you get jobs, you get a job, you possibly want more promotion, and therefore you take on more education. So there is a feedback and a feed forward mechanism. And then the, feedback, the, the mechanism between education and, and inter, entrepreneurship, and something very, very important is what in this relationship, say if you took this uh, dimension, uh, I don't have a stick by the way, that could, uh, I, don't, I don't have paper. Let's, let me see whether I can use my cursor. The, the link between jobs and entrepreneurship. To say that sometimes companies innovate, individuals innovate, okay? And innovation is simply just trying to get a product and turn it around. Turn around a motorcycle 
into a career for a say for, for a truck. Okay. Does it necessarily create more jobs? In most cases, yes. Sometimes no. Because you innovate and have automatic barriers for opening a gate. Okay. At a time when by the people that were doing this manually have to look for alternative employment. So that innovation is actually has a cost on job creation or job availability. So maybe we need to look at it in this kind of relationship. Maybe we need to have a different configuration. We need to look at it in terms, not in terms of uh, uh, by variate or by direction or causality, one causes the other, but in terms of a circular. Okay. So you have here a circular form uh, in which basically you are moving from education, more education, more entrepreneurship, more entrepreneurship, more jobs, and more jobs also enhances education. And so here involves two things, a quantitative change you can give a value and say education has improved in Uganda by 40%. Or during COVID, the quality of education slammed fell by 10%. So it could be the quantitative change, it could also be the qualitative change. But what we are looking at is the fact that uh, it's, a, it's, it's a circular motion. What does this model mean? If you took a model of having, say, from education to entrepreneurship, then to jobs, back to education, back to entrepreneurship, and the, and the cycle goes. What it means is that strategically for governments, strategically for international organizations, strategically for companies, strategically for you as an individual, you need to be able to spot the entry point. The entry point will matter. Okay. So maybe I didn't get education up to university, but I became an entrepreneur. And then I created more jobs. And so that I can earn more education. Because you could either leave school at 16, and then later on go to university and earn degrees. In fact, in many countries in the world, there is a premium. Governments pay support money for inclusive education. That is, those people who are working, they have not been through the usual, the usual school channel whereby you come from primary school to secondary school and then to university. No, you possibly do primary and then uh, two years working and then do high school and then two years working or possibly get a job or possibly even get married. And then you say, okay, now I need a degree. And then you go back. This is a, a very important aspect what distinguishes the quality of education across countries. Are individuals who want education later able to do it? I was training PhD scholars from uh, Africa, many countries, in Nairobi through the African Economic Research Consortium. A Nigerian lady was doing a PhD in economics, one of the scholars. And she was really a thoroughly mathematical. She was one of a praise staff. And at one time, just in a quick conversation and coffee, she asked me a very puzzling question. He said, Professor, do you think I can now read for a degree in medicine? Where did that come from? <laughs> She's doing a PhD in economics, with the first degree in economics, a master's in economics, doing a PhD about to complete a degree in economics. And then she's doing a PhD, she wants to do a PhD in economics. I asked her, are you so much enthused that you want to be a doctor? He said, this was my dream, but many things interrupted, and I had to read it for me. I said, there are many great universities in the world that on the basis of your ongoing PhD in economics, will admit you to do a degree in medicine. She went to Cape Town. She's now a doctor in Nigeria. Now, this is the way you can be motivated and transformed. I'm saying this actually much more fundamentally because I get a surprise in terms of uh, the way we look at education, like the way we looked at education when I was undergraduate at McKellery, seems to still be the way um, we look at education. Education is supposed to give you the 
testing the condition at university that you are highly trainable. So you may do a degree in fine art. Okay. Uh, Father Miamire knows uh, my son did uh, a degree in fine art, got a first class in fine art. He's now a chief accountant. How does somebody who is doing fine art at university being able to become a certified accountant? Maybe this wouldn't happen here because organizational individuals have a hangover when you say, I want to be an accountant. They say, did you study BCom accounting? That should never arise at all. The fact that somebody has got a first class degree in any subject means they are highly trainable. For the younger people, I tell you, follow your dream. Just follow your dream. Okay. The degree you have taken is just a, an indication on how trainable you are, how you can easily absorb factors and continue. And it may well be the case that the world in 10 years' time will not be distinguishing whether you have a degree in geography or not. You can become a fintech engineer if you want to train to be so. And so this comes into actually explaining, say, the relationship between education and jobs. Because you have a way of getting the education through university, as you have now, completing your degree. And then, what do you do after? I could even give me examples here. One of the great um, uh, economists uh, whom I work with, uh, um, and uh, he's one of the leading economists in the world, uh, his first degree was in physics, his second degree was in physics, his PhD was in physics, he's now a great economist. So you see, yeah, he's now a great economist. And that was the way of transforming thinking, okay, are you gonna bring physics to economics? For many years, economists has been influenced by uh, uh, mathematics until about 10 years ago, when everything changed. Economics is today being influenced by psychology, okay? And this guy, when he started a psychologist going into economics, I remember, yes, uh, uh, George at one of the conferences, supposedly eight years ago, and he was explaining the idea of habit persistence from psychology. That if somebody has a tendency to uh, behave one way, this habit will continue, habit persistence. Economics was, we were preaching something different in economics. We are saying rational expectations, okay? Once you make a mistake, you can't make it again because you learn. It is learning, monitoring, evaluation, and learning. I learned that here is uh, Augusta Co. So because I have seen it, seen it, next time I go over it. I make a mistake and then I learn. I don't make the same mistake again. No, no. Psychology doesn't say so. Psychology says there is habit persistence. Some people get into habits and they don't change. You grow from 20 to 60, 70, you are still the same guy committing the same maybe mistake. Okay. So psychology has taught us, has enabled us to, invert, to actually avoid a lot of financial crises. The reason why we have had financial crises almost every 10 years is because people don't learn. Investors don't learn. They make the same mistake. Okay. And they invest funds, the funds go under. The crisis is not your mistake. It's not you and I's mistake. It's of the global investors who have a big investment funds bigger than the GDP of this country. Okay. And when they make a mistake and what goes under, then of course the consequences happen. So there is a great deal to understand between uh, education, entrepreneurship, jobs, and it could be in a circular formation. But maybe is in a kind of a, a standard Venn diagram uh, from simple primary school mathematics, okay? That basically, when you put together education, entrepreneurship, and employment, there is some shaded area that interacts the interaction. So there is an interaction between education and entrepreneurship, but most of education may not have nothing to do at all with entrepreneurship. I can give you a living example. I think my education has nothing to do with entrepreneurship because I have never invented anything to trade. Okay. So maybe there will be education and entrepreneurship, but there are those education, even at the lowest level of education, who can become great entrepreneurs. If you look at the, uh, the new companies in Uganda in the last 10 years, uh, manufacturing honey, exporting flowers, uh, um, 
uh, making uh, juices they sell, uh, producing quality food, uh, producing clothes. That is in kind of uh, innovation. And it may not necessarily arise from a given level of uh, education. And then the link that between jobs, entrepreneurship, and in this part of the shaded area within uh, the Venn diagram. So maybe we need to understand the component. You see, this is not for the sake of, for the sake of it, no. it's not for policy. It's for understanding that if you're a policymaker, okay, uh, in a government, if you are uh, the third sector, this is the uh, civil society, uh, who even when they demonstrate around and they are causing for change, because the, the social society, civil society, is a very big force. We are trying to see whether the component of intersection among education and jobs can expand. Whether the relationship between education and entrepreneurship can expand rather than contract. If for the sake of argument, just for the sake of argument, the intersection dwindled and everything became separate, education has no link with entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship has no link with jobs. We are finished. We are finished. We are comatose. Because basically it means the three are not in connection at all. This harmony. It has happened. I could give you an example uh, 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 in a, one of the African economies without causing a consternation. Because for many years, for the last say 10 years, there has not been this kind of connection. Everything is, is can disarray. Actually, not one more, not one more African country. Possibly, I could have about a, you know three examples of where this is happening, okay. and those countries which are on the verge of uh, reaching there, and the, you know, problems in South Sudan, problems in Ethiopia. We have, uh, it is possible that these three components will be completely separate without the harmony or that, that brings everything together. Maybe. This is critical. That the relationship has a way of a strong causality. You see in this framework, what you have are direct links. Education leading to entrepreneurship and leading to jobs with feed forward and feedback mechanism. And then you had education without ent entrepreneurship but leading to jobs. This is the upper loop from education the jobs. Most of us, I think, followed this thing. Okay. You get your education, you look for a job, you get it, you start working, and on and on. Or you get it, you, uh, you, 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 you come from, you have your job, and then you always go for continuous professional development. Any job you have, you have to do some, you know, some um, a training, continuous professional development, Revising the models, revising the work, work, revising the way of the things, and therefore giving you some form of education. But in this model, we find that basically we have a direct route through which education affects jobs, a direct route through which jobs affect education, and then uh, indirectly working through entrepreneurship. But now I want to give uh, a context of education because we've talked about education, but without explaining really what it would be, or in the context of this discussion today, what is it that we are using to cover education? The current way of configuring education, at least in the economics profession, is looking at it as human capital. You see, a especially for most researchers like me who do econometric quantitative work, for every concept, we get a measure. Yeah. Because you can't manage it if you can't measure it. So we get a measure. And how do we measure education? We measure education using a human capital concept. And in terms of firm education, we look at elementary school, secondary school, and university. And each time you invest at this level, you get a return on your education. Most people used to think that the highest return on education is at university. 
not necessarily so. I think all the uh, um, estimation I have done for an investment in education, I have never found it at university. The highest return are in primary school and secondary school. And that's why, for example, governments are persuaded to provide free primary school education and free and higher accessible and should be high quality uh, primary and secondary school education. And then, of course, you they have the informal education. You have even the first education, whereby you can read and self-educate yourself. Or you have the continuous professional development, other, uh, um, which I refer to CPD, in terms of adult education, skill employment, or learn as you want. And see the concept of looking at that human capital. And for some people who may have had a it's simple exposure to economics is that we look at education and prosperity, economic prosperity, economic prosperity of an individual, economic prosperity of a country. And we start with something we call like a production function. And then in that, in understanding how goods are produced, how services are produced, we include in the element of human capital as education becomes so important. This is because uh, much of the economics, economics is a relatively young subject, by the way, uh, came up about 1910. There was never economics, there was political economy. Finance, my own discipline, is younger than me. Right. The finance didn't become until one of the greatest papers, uh, say, in the early 60s. So these disciplines keep on changing as researchers uh, uncover more knowledge and they engage with more knowledge. What we have learned is that when Lucas, who won the Nobel Prize um, uh, in economics, started looking at explaining how do countries grow? Why is the growth rate in Kenya higher than that of Uganda? And why the growth rate in Uganda higher than the growth rate in Switzerland? You know how to look at the way goods and services are produced. It's really a production function. In the early 60s, they would say it's because of technical progress. And then the question, where does technical progress come from? What? Does it drop like manna from heaven? Where does technical progress? Lucas could not explain. You could not tell where technical progress come from. Where does it come from? So this is why. Most researchers, and, and this is the, the channel that I, I pursue if I, from my own, they can speak from my own set of interest, is to think in terms of the new way of looking at growth and production. It's called endogenous, endogenous growth theory. Some people may squeeze and say indigenous growth theory. No, it's not necessarily indigenous, okay? Or maybe almost indigenous. But is endogenous comes from within, endogenous comes from within. The fundamental understanding of gross, endogenous growth theory has helped us to understand that being a developing country like Uganda has its own blessings. Right? We have a lot of capacity. We have a lot of capacity and human capacity and the capacity for growth. So in endogenous growth theory, it explains how economies grow. It, it explains the fact that an industrial economy like UK and the US cannot grow at 6%. No, they have exhausted all capacity. So there is a curve, if they continue to grow in the next 10 years, and we grow at 10%, at 10 we shall meet them, the curve bunch, and shoot over to pursue them. It's not a dream. It's not a dream. And I can give you an example, China. In the, next 10, in the next 10 years, China will challenge the U.S. at the global economy. You can't stop it. Even if you, even if you want it, you can't stop it. All the indicators are shown. Okay. Part of my uh, accident is to follow track, you know, track uh, the mega trends. I track mega trends, where the mega trends are going. And Almost every week, I'll see if there is anything that has perturbed um, the world economy in which the, the trend may change. I can confidently say 
there is nothing that's going to change the trend in China, the trend of, of growth in China. The trend in productivity, the trend in investment, the trend in growth, the trend in shipping and distribution across the world. Nothing will change that. So the whole idea is therefore to say, you may be a developing country now, but the younger graduates now and their children tomorrow will be able to sustain an economy and bypass the rate of growth of industrial economies. We have advantages, we have population, the population dividend. In some economies in the world, population is declining. In other words, we may be growing the population at 3%. Some people used to say that's a bad factor. No, my economics doesn't so, so it's a very, it's a very important factor. Because some economies are contracting. In other words, the population is being cut down, cut down, cut down completely. And the only way they do is they, they, it's, it's something that cannot change. So indigenous growth theory says basically that you are growing and growing and eventually you catch up. There is high productivity and catch up. In fact, the way we start in the, doing the equation for that, we write the algorithm, we start with a negative value. So you put yourself at the bottom with a negative value and you shoot and shoot, turn positive, turn positive, and you see that the economy, 10 years projections, you see the economy superseding the other industry economy. And we don't go like, hey, okay, you have to get a 2.2 and you float. No, 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 no. This is done through a process called stochastic simulation. So you do like 1 million projections. And you, you take the mean and the standard deviation. The simple concepts you pick from primary school. Mean, the average, standard deviation, the departure from the standard deviation. The mean is five and the standard deviation is one, which means the value could be five, it could be four, it could be six. So you work within that threshold of four and six. And that's how we make the projection. The projections are, according to endogenous growth theory, human capital is so important. And as long as we keep the education going, as long as we allow for vehicles of innovation, there will be higher growth. And that is why education is so important. So the rule of human capital and introduce you to the concept of endogenous growth as the leading model that gives the confidence to developing countries and given confidence um, uh, to the young graduates that it will lead to um, uh, continued growth. And so what, um, what we do here is just try to do a, a sunshine and happiness story. This is a scatter diagram in which you can have, say, I could have here sunshine and happiness to explain that basically as you get more sunshine, you become happy, but sometimes the sunshine becomes so hot that then you become unhappy. So this is comparing two, two values, sunshine and happiness. But in this case, we are comparing uh, economic growth or economic prosperity. Oh, by the way, there is a new measure. I don't know whether you have come across it. In some of my work, I have shared, I don't use economic growth, economic. I use economic happiness. And people say you can't measure, you can actually measure happiness. Economic happiness. So you could have economic happiness here, economic growth, and then education in terms of school enrollment. And what you can see here is that there is a high, high relationship, high correlation between uh, education at the secondary school level and economic growth. That even when you change it and look at a government expenditure on education, I think the government here was reading the budget um, two weeks ago, one week ago, two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago. The figure to keep is looking at um, the expenditure, the percentage of the budget that is going to education. That helps uh, a great deal. Uh, in a developing country, most of the um, education, that first E, Many is driven by government expenditure, but also in many industry, industry countries, you find that uh, companies and individuals uh, drive a, um, the government expenditure on education. Um, as you know, uh, you may know this, but in our master's degree programs and PhD programs in the UK, what do you guess is the proportion of Chinese students in a class? Say, in my MSc on finance and investments, 
I have about 120 students. About 100 are from China. Yes. Yes, that's the proportion. Almost 80 to 90 percent of the students are from China. And the rest are possibly from other countries in the world, including Africa. And the local chaps will be possibly about one or two. Never more than five. And this is why I was telling you about the kind of global trends that are happening. Okay. So, in this case, as you can see, most of the Chinese students are self-sponsored. They are either sponsoring themselves, they leave the university, work for one year, save because of good salaries, and then they sponsor themselves to all, or their parents sponsor them. Okay. So here, government expenditure is an indicator of education, but could also be um, the expenditure out of households on education could also be a good measure in some return. But what we see is that influences is economic growth. What about the, uh, the second E of entrepreneurship? And here basically for me, entrepreneurship is about innovation. Copycat entrepreneurship is not entrepreneurship, whereby um, uh, you see uh, the vice chancellor may start a fish pond for business. I go and look at it and say, okay, where did you get the people to dig this pond? You tell me, and then I go and start the business there. That's not, that's not entrepreneurship. The copy cut whereby you see this is working, you see somebody open a restaurant and even, that's not entrepreneurship, basically. It's copy cut because there is no innovation behind it. Innovation is a way of trying to bring something new, you know, to the market. And whether you are manufacturing a shirt, you find a way in which you can add something on the design of the shirt and have something new. So there's something of adding, but you add it, and then producing a new product. That is the innovation, or the processes, the way something is done. And that's the kind of entrepreneurship that has value added, which can be kind of sustainable. So, as again, when you look at the innovation in the way of bringing new products, new processes, that's actually very fruitful entrepreneurship. Replicative of something existing normally leads to flooding the market and then the new company not being able to get a niche in the market and finally collapses. This is the experience also of most industrial economy. In 1928 in the UK, there is what they called a fringe banking crisis. A fringe banking crisis was happening because uh, coming out of the end of First World War, individuals were interested in starting commercial banks. Growing commercial banks in a country is not straightforward. It's not easy. Because number one limitation is if we all, if 20% of us here started the commercial bank. Where shall we get the people to work in the commercial bank? You know, who understand to do the normal balances, okay. Understand to actually to be able to assess a uh, bit of learning, uh, of giving loan. Okay. So what ended up here in the UK in 1928, because there was competition of getting people to work in the bank, they could get a simple clerk on the front desk and appoint them supervisor. And then all the new people without any much training, or education. And then of course, all banks were, and all of a sudden, all banks collapsed. There was a crisis. And then central bank came in. And then new regulation came into place in terms of, to set a, to start a bank, you have no training, but also you have to ensure that you have managerial positions who can lead the way the bank should operate. And I know uh, uh, some people in the East African area who have tried to start a bank, and also in Ghana, they um, uh, have been worked with the uh, governor for some time, whereby banks start and after two weeks they are closed. Because they think they can make it, but you don't have enough people to where they can be able to run the bank. And wishing and doing something are two separate entities. So replicative entrepreneurship does not help because basically you pursue a dream that cannot be done. Responding to opportunity is also great, but again, there are things you have to put in place. And the one of the necessity happens because there is a market for this kind of 
um, uh, entrepreneurship and innovation. In fact, what is interesting is to see how entrepreneurship grows across the world. So in our research center in SOAS, we have entrepreneurial measures almost for every country in the world. We keep on watching where new companies are coming from, how competitive they are. And let me tell you, my greatest pleasure when I watch this is to see a family of companies we have called Pan-African banks. Pan-African banks. Pan-African banks are banks started by Africans, sometimes from microfinance companies, started by African, working for African businesses, African organizations, and we are giving a lot of discomfort to global banks like Barclays and others because they understand the market. And so they have a way of understanding entrepreneurship, providing businesses, supporting schools, supporting young universities. They respond and sit down with you and do a 10-year financing strategy. Unfortunately, we don't have a Pan-African bank in Uganda. None of them is a Pan-African bank. Maybe in a couple of years, maybe two years, Centenary could be a Pan-African bank if it works outside Uganda and takes on board some other countries. That's my wish. But uh, a good number, in, when I draw a map of Africa, uh, there are four hubs where the Pan-African banks who have the entrepreneurial innovation have come from. There is a hub in Nigeria, the Nigerian banks, who are also present here in Uganda. There is a hub in Kenya, Kenyan banks which are here, like NCBA, Kenya Commercial Bank. Those are Pan-African. You can be, when you walk on the square mile in London, of all the banks in the world, those Kenyan banks are there. Those Nigerian banks are there. The other source of Pan-African banks is uh, Morocco. And actually, Morocco is very, very interesting. The king of Morocco will go to any country to make route for that bank established there. He was last in Tanzania, and two days later they open up a branch, even when the bank is not owned by government. So there is a, um, a Morocco as a sort of an African bank. The third hub is in South Africa, where South African banks are dominating. They started by dominating the whole of Southern Africa, but they are now here. And they go where angels don't trade. They go to DRC. Even when the way in the DRC is going on, they go there. Why do they go? Because the mining companies, one of the worst mining companies are funded by them. They can share their risk. And they used to, when I was at the African Development Bank, they used to come with the calculation and say, okay, we are going into DRC, it's risky, but you never know. They, if the risk is 13%, but the return on the investment is 22, okay, I could even lose 13. But where? <laughs> you have 90 percent to go on. So you take the risk, and maybe the risk doesn't material, and the return materialize. So they have a high profitability in the uh, a, a cottage mining in the DRC. And the Pan African banks from South Africa are uh, much into it. I think now they are uh, Kenyan banks, um, Nigerian banks, uh, Morocco hasn't been. Yeah, but, uh, and I think that is also a, uh, a thing for us as. Um, we could be able to go there. So what you have here is the kind of entrepreneurial bank. I see there are very um, variations. The fact that a country is OECD, like Japan and Italy, does not mean that it has got a high degree of entrepreneurship. Remember what I was saying, that most of the OECD countries have grown to capacity. They can't exceed that capacity. They have reached their limits. All the opportunities, they have two opportunities. A, they can only come and work with the developing countries where they learn to grow as a growth center. Okay. But also, developing countries are going to have a chance of being able to work and match up and expand their growth. That means you and I and all will actually grow in the, in, the, in, the, in the growth of that process. So there are variations, and uh, it's very interesting here to see Chile 
uh, and um, uh, uh, Chile is one of the countries of uh, interest I follow. I uh, work closely with the member of the uh, Board of Governors of Chile. So it was, uh, you'll see her on my web, on uh, the website. Uh, uh, she's 75, but growing strong every day <laughs> as a researcher. And uh, is very much imagined to the revolution in Chile in start of starting to get funding for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. When a, a young organization, including the university, get funding for 20 years, and basically, you can be sure that, you know, you, you, you all not follow the trajectory and pray every year that things fall in the place. And then you can, because you have the assurances of uh, yeah. And so in South Africa, United Kingdom, yes, they, they have, okay. The, the entrepreneurship is actually because, um, uh, because they keep the patent rights. They keep the patent rights. Um, so uh, the rights for patents to be able to kind of produce. Um, and then uh, you have um, Egypt, you have Canada, growth, and Brazil. Yeah, Brazil is one of the growth areas. Okay. What I want to, uh, um, a model is basically a framework. Okay. A framework that shows the relationship, the way the variables interact. What can we put forward as a model or a framework, a mechanism for entrepreneurial activity? Remember that that framework is theoretical. And for us who do empirical work, we get a theory like this, we put it together, then we collect numbers on it, and then when we try to do the testing, sometimes it breaks down. When it breaks down, please don't keep a flawed model because you love the theory. Just dispose it because it won't work. Theoretically, it won't work. It's like, it's like what most researchers do, you get an idea at 2 a.m. In the old style, we didn't have computers. You wake up, you get your pencil, and start to write you know, a mathematical model. 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m., 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock, you realize, oh my, oh dear, I've made such a terrible mistake. When you do, please put everything in the bin and continue. Don't continue with the flawed model, because already you know you are self convinced that the framework does not work. So the framework here for entrepreneurship activity is driven by a number of factors. The first one is political freedom. Political freedom means that actually individuals are free to innovate and start industry. They are free in the sense that if I innovated and found a way of manufacturing um, long-lasting nails for construction, which there is a construction boom in the country, that tomorrow there is nobody who snatches it from me and says, this is my own paper side. So you have the freedom to innovate as much as possible. As, lo as long as you do it formally, you form your company, you form your organization, you pay your taxes, you do everything you know, legit, legitimate. Okay. So that freedom of innovation is very important. The second is, of course, the freedom from corruption. Corruption disseminates the kills because, you know, what it kills, what? It's not, it's not necessarily the moral side of it. I, I leave the moral side of it. Uh, uh, the people who talk about it now, I'm not qualified now to do that. It kills because it's a cost. As an economist, I say, uh, uh, corruption is a cost. Why? Because for something that should be costing one million, if I have to bribe the official another million, the cost to raise is immediately doubles to two million. And I cannot recover that when I do investment. Maybe I don't have enough profits to be able to continuously uh, pay corruption. And some countries have been caught in that web whereby basically corruption goes up for every activity. You land at an airport, not necessarily in Eastern Africa, but maybe in West Africa, land at an airport, and they say, get the airport, I want chop. You say chop, that means you have put in $100. That's a cost already. So corruption becomes um, a very important part in explaining um, uh, entrepreneurial activity. Of course, the other important element is one of our ease we have been looking at education. 
Culture is so important, uh, but not the way not the way we understand culture. If you are coming from social sciences, okay, you know, the world is different culture. No, no, that's not the culture we are referring to here. We are referring the uh, the psychological culture, and I will draw here from a paper I did recently. Uh, with a uh, young lady, Kashefi, where we are looking at uh, what really explains the growth of banks across the country. Is it the culture of the CEO? The culture is an attitude, is an attitude of the entrepreneur or the CEO or the managing director, whereby they have a culture, for example, to be assertive. I, in other words, saying to themselves, I will achieve this come heavy rain or high water. Okay. The resolution that they want. I will achieve this come heavy rain or high water. But there is also the culture of actually being able to uh, uh, possibly give in to pressure or possibly being able to give up immediately and be dismissive. So the culture is the psychological reaction of the, inter of the entrepreneur. And if you are going to entrepreneurship, you need to go in with the determination that you know things have to happen. And so these factors uh, seem to be very, very important in explaining entrepreneurial activity. And maybe I can take an excursion into looking at some of the factors. This is the map of the world. Okay. We are there. We, um, uh, this, this, come on. We, we, we are somewhere on the map on Africa, as you can see. What, are this, what we are trying to capture on this map of the world a global phenomenon is the extent to which education and training, the two types of education and continuous professional development or training, is creating or managing small and medium enterprises, the smallest companies. Okay. The smallest companies in, the, in this country, they actually provide the backbone of the economy in both this country and in Kenya. Okay. And how this is incorporated, what we learn about these companies, how this is incorporated into education and training. For example, if these young people got a fund and they wanted to go into enterprising, they would possibly start with a small company. This would be a, an SME. Okay. Unfortunately, the evidence we have is SMEs tend to die in the, in the first three years of their youth. So my paper, which I share with you now, is why do they die so young? So when I read the paper, why do they die so young? I was not talking about people. I was talking about companies. Because I spent about eight months in Kenya taking data on what they call juakali, eh? feel the heat of the sunshine. These are the ones who work on the sun from morning to evening. They are making metal, they are working crafts. It's a big, big, big industry. And I wanted to understand, number one, where do they get the money? Number two, they are highly skilled. What they are producing and they sell tourists have high skills, but some of them have never been to school. Well, you can go to Katwe in Kampala. What they do? Again, these are operating at a small scale. How do they do their marketing? How do they share the money when they get it? Who finances them? What understanding is that some of them collapse so young? That's why, how do they are? And when I computed the startup and econometric model, I find that they die within the first three years. I called it the valley of death. If they can avoid that valley of death in the first three years, they survive. At that time, they have learned, they know how to survive, they know how to need to work, they know how to market their products, they know how to get enough money. Okay. They don't get the money from banks. Banks won't stand them because banks need a feasibility study and a, a company of registration. Those companies don't have. Okay. But here is basically to see that they, the best way of embedding it, that's key, is to have entrepreneurship being taught 
at primary school and secondary school as a subject. So you understand what entrepreneurship is. If you introduce it to these young uh, graduates, maybe it's a little bit too late because of the human. Of course, some people will take it up. And of course, there is something I'm going to add about a why a um, thinking of a scheme designed for young graduates with entrepreneurship requires much more than just saying it, just any kind of commitment. But much of it of embedding, as we can see from this map, including Uganda, is how the SME's training has been incorporated in the elementary, the primary, and secondary school levels. It doesn't happen in, say, you know, in Canada and other countries, but it does happen in some countries. This is a little bit, the second is a bit tricky about how to embed entrepreneurship starting from very small companies. This will be a company of two people. It could be a family shop, okay, Victor Marine and Daughters, okay, starting a bakery and just doing that. That's a small shop and it can grow, it can expand. If you are able to innovate, produce a new type of bread that everyone wants, everyone wants, but which is now not in the market funds, the tax flows from me to government, from banks to government, from company to government. The negative one, the negative tax, flows from government to individuals. If you get a subsidy, if you get some help, uh, if you get um, a subsidy, a pension, maybe a payment from government because of your role, that is also a tax, but it's a subsidy, it's a negative tax. It's an accounting form of present negative. So here, that the, when a company is the same as for, get from, suppose you started, say, the graduates from St. Joseph University who want to enterprise and go on their own, if they start in and register company, okay, they will get a subsidy of no taxes for three years or five years, okay, and we'll get the minimal support to give them going. We shall give them training, we shall give them support. That is a tax, but initially it is negative because they are getting money from government to do so. It's a great help. But it is not lost. Because when they start to make phenomenal money in five years, the government will get that money back. So it's like accounting, the dynamics of accounting. Accounting in real in, in, in time. So if I started and started planning, like NPA, okay. So I could say, I am now, I'm gonna fund a, a 10,000 graduates from the various universities, of course, including from Europe. And this is the amount of subsidy they're gonna put there and so forth, knowing that at least 80% of them will succeed when they're given the training. When they do, year two, year three, year four they have launched, year five, some of the companies may even list on the stock exchange and get more money. And then the government will start collecting in the money. Over time, over 10 years, the government is a winner because it will be full supply. If you look at it in one year or two years, you usually start to do it. You always look at it as if it's missed. You're only looking at the value of how much am I getting taxation every year. I'm going, no, you can't do it that way. You need a long-term project trajectory in which you can now do this and say, this is the strategy of one of them. That necessarily, no, it's not. Okay, foreign investors can play an important role, especially if they are taking on board, if they are taking on board investments from the locals. In other words, the, um, the foreign investor is an investor 80%, 20% is coming from the locals. However, however small, how much money they put in? Okay, because they could put in five million and still be part of a big company of uh, 100 million. Okay. So this is part of it that sometimes we should not, we, the, the taxes contention of it and bureaucracy is, is a negative tax, which will be a subsidy to the entrepreneur. Okay. I don't know, I, um, I, I have got a tendency of speaking for five hours now, so uh, uh, um, we have in the economic society meetings, uh, when the president is speaking, uh, somebody has stopped him. Because if he stops, it means he has run out of ideas. So the president keeps talking, 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 and still the chair says, okay, I think we are now closing down. So, uh, chair, please feel free to stop me if I am uh, overdoing it and uh, getting people bored on this, okay. And then there is a culture on social norms. Um, a colleague of mine uh, who is um, an, at Makere asked me, uh, we met in a Korea at one of the, um, the G20 meetings. And we looked at the achievements in Korea, phenomenal. We said, 
why are these people achieving so much? And yet, in the 1960s, they were at the same level as Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania. Yeah. Why? How have they been able to do it? Really? Even if when you read, I don't know whether you have it in the library, but I can get you that book, Asian Drama, by a guy called Guna Mirado, the Asian drama. He was saying Asia is so poor. Okay? You see, another book say in the 60s, Asia was so poor. Now, when you go and look at those countries now, phenomenal, Malaysia. Malaysia manufacturing and exporting vehicles, producing all hardware. How do, they, how do they do it? What is it that they did and we need to do? Now, by the way, this question, the answer to this question, uh, I fight with a colleague at Oxford on this question. I always tell him he's ideological. His answers to them right, has, has something behind this. It's not straightforward intellectual. Okay. So this answer is being answered by, this question is being answered by many people with different answers. To me, the genuine answer is a commitment. To some people, they say Africa didn't pay attention to some opportunities. No, 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 that's not, that's, not, that's not the answer. That's not the answer. I think Africa paid so much attention to some opportunities, but there was a problem in the balance of, um, in the balance of trade and in the balance of the world economy. Uh, that put uh, African countries at a disadvantage, that drove African countries into debt and the structure adjustment that is organized the economy is beyond repair. Okay. That's not an African problem. Okay. I think that uh, the main reason for some of these countries is about the culture and social norms, the commitment to work, the determination, the enforcement, that has changed quite, quite a lot. I think now most of African countries have turned the corner in terms of their commitment to growth and therefore should be able to uh, grow phenomenally. Here I use, uh, again, another chart of looking at sunshine and happiness, looking at the entrepreneurship uh, and uh, economic growth. It has a U-shaped relationship. So basically, uh, the economies grow, entrepreneurship can also grow. And I hope that, say, from the perspective uh, of this own country, of our own country, is that basically the growth that is happening now also is actually underpinned by the growth uh, in entrepreneurship. And even if you separate high income countries from low income countries, you find a, a pattern. By low income countries, you find that um, uh, there is some necessity based type of entrepreneurship. But as we get more and use more technology, we shall be driven by innovation and try to change some of the products we produce. I looked at the International Labour Organization, which has uh, very, very, very clear data, very good data on employment. Uh, what I find that in this data, there is a tendency to, um, to uh, ignore or overlook self-employment, self-employment in developing countries as a form of employment, and especially self-employment in services. And yet this is where the greatest opportunity is for developing countries like Uganda. Then uh, you have, of course, uh, the uh, entrepreneurship versus executive managers. This is something is based on a theory called agency theory. Uh, basically, you start a company because you want to be um, a big entrepreneur, you want to own it. You hire executives, and executives are working because they want better pay. They want better pay, big car, big house, big returns. The problem is how do you reconcile it? How do you reconcile the wishes of you, the entrepreneur, and the managers that you employ? You can't keep an eye on them 100%. How do you make sure that your workers are not running away with your money? You don't have to plant cameras in their office. No, no, no. You use again, you know, use again a theory, the question of monitoring. You use incentives, for example, the incentives. You use the auditing and evaluation methods to be able to make sure that you are keeping, yeah, that uh, you are able to uh, uh, keep, uh, um, that you are able to see what they do. And eventually, it's the, um, 
the reconciling the wishes of the entrepreneur and the managers that you can achieve very successful entrepreneurship um, uh, for businesses. Uh, I've possibly covered a lot about entrepreneurship and human capital. Let me also see that we see that entrepreneurship creates jobs. This is the tendency that there is a positive correlation between the jobs created and the growth of entrepreneurship in many countries of the world featured here, which includes developing countries as well as OECD. So entrepreneurship by young entrepreneurs or entrepreneurship is job created. What about the status quo in Uganda? Does the Kubo still hold the status? That's the status quo. Does the Kubo still hold the status? Okay. What did we know from current data about the education and employment? Only 50%, only 15% of all university graduates join the labor force. Only about 5% become self-employed in the formal sector. Others keep on looking. But I think our understanding has been possibly based on some, some fallacies, mistaken belief in terms of what we think um, I underpin this. I have attended conferences and listened to many great talks whereby the blame is on the school and the university curriculum. So they becoming to tell the vice chancellor that you should change the curriculum uh, because to make sure that uh, your graduates get jobs. You know I don't believe that. And I've been explaining that actually what you do get from university gives you a portfolio of highly trainable. You are highly trainable. You could move into any sector. But secondly, universities actually responded to the market. When I went to university, there was no degree in journalism. At least in Makere, there was no degree in pharmacy. There was no degree in the land survey. Now, all these degrees have now come up in response to the market. You can read a degree, you can, you can read communication, uh, you can do pharmacy, you can do biomedical sciences. You are not a doctor, but you work in hospital in various dimensions. All these have been uh, incorporated in the curriculum to be able to prepare certain groups of people for market. But it's not the fundamental change that you are looking for. You are looking for um, very competent graduates that have high, a high degree of training and opportunities for them. Simply because when, if you argue, if you argue, let's take for the second one, you argue, that because universities have not changed their curriculum so much, let's suppose for the sake of argument that they do, what you do is actually supply graduates in the market who think that this will be the demand for them. But what about the sector, the absorption, the, 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 for example, industry, okay, and the employers? What about if they don't create opportunities for jobs? Yeah. So you cannot look on at the supply side, which is what the university produces graduates. There is also the demand side. Is private sector growing? Is private sector growing at 1% or 10%? In actual fact, let us invert the argument. If private sector was growing at 15% per year, the young graduates would be trainable by the, by, the, by the sector. Why do I think like this? Because, uh, sorry, uh, I need to get back to, uh, sorry. Um, to, I need to, okay, sorry, I disrupted. Maybe this thing is saying I'm talking too much. Um, okay, I can't find, oh yeah, got it, got it, got it. Ah, ah, that's good, okay. Go back to my arguments, which I think is kind of a critical. Suppose, it's, it's okay, can you see? Hmm? Oh. Ah, okay.
Thank you. Okay, thank you. So let's take the sake of argument that say uh, universities have responded 100 percent to the demands from the uh, um, uh, change the curriculum uh, adjusting continuously every year to meet the demands in the industry. They've produced the graduates. But the private sector has to grow, has to grow in the jobs. They have to grow phenomenally. Uh, governments can only absorb a certain percentage. So the problem has been that the growth in the private sector has been very constrained. And however much universities change, they may not be able to, uh, produ to, to be producing graduates that are in ultimately being absorbed uh, in creative uh, employment. So the demand side of the, uh, this argument is not addressed. Because if it was the demand side expanding, then of course the, um, the output from uh, universities would be highly trainable. And therefore would be ending up taking up these, uh, these jobs. The fallacy number two is about the role of science. Uh, and I think the example I gave you about the, um, the PhD in economics, the lady that turned into a doctor, is just an example. But I think the uh, concentration of science starts not at university, it starts at the primary school and secondary level, whereby uh, they have primary tools to be able to persuade uh, people to go into this school. At the end of the day, the other disciplines are fundamentally important in our science, even in a very industrial economy. When you look at the, uh, the data on uh, green business climate in Uganda, there are two important factors which are identified every year. One is infrastructure, the second is finance. So even if we say that all 500 graduates from St. Joseph uh, we support them to go into job creation, they create jobs. Yes, yeah, that's, that's very positive. We should encourage our graduates to actually create jobs for themselves rather than job seekers. But they will, not, they will not do the infrastructure. They will not have the infrastructure. They can't put together the infrastructure. They can't put together the laws that allow individuals. They, they don't put together the laws that enable them to register a company in one day. They don't put together laws that will enable them to actually be able to trade and market their product. Importantly, they will not put together a mechanism that will enable them to sell their produce to Kenya, Tanzania, or Rwanda, or any of the South African countries. They will not put together a formation in which, for example, they may be able to seek and get a job in Nairobi. Because I know I'm part of the board, and you're gonna, you have to get the work permit to work in Nairobi, even when we're in the South African country. So some of those constraints are there, and they are part of it. So yes, it does make a great sense to say uh, that um, a, um, a, um, um, the graduates should be um, promoted to become uh, entrepreneurs, and do this is the right channel. It's what is happening uh, in the world over. And in fact, there are more younger people now involved in development work than ever before, because they form because of the, of the method of my, the method now of doing job is called outsourcing. So they come, come they form companies that can be able to outsource, outsource every dimension. In fact, the people involved in outsourcing in various major companies are between the age of 25 and 35. So yes, that's a growth area. But that doesn't, that also mean that we have to look at the, the dimension of what has to be put in place in terms of infrastructure and finance. And of course, also what we, as a member of a very active region, we have to fight for in terms of getting access. So sometimes the poor may not have no status. What has to be done is, you know, what should be, and I'm coming back to this point in conclusion. Um, this may be possible in terms of fostering entrepreneurship through education and growth. I think I'm covered in a way I, um, I put here finance not on top. If I went to my rural village and I say, uh, are you starting business? They say, we can't start business. We can't start business because we have no finance. So the traditional way is to put finance on top. No, no, no. Finance is not on top. If we put finance on top, you'll get the money and still eat the money. It doesn't spend the money and consume it and no business will start. 
in corporate finance, second year corporate finance of undergraduate, right? The main of consideration for any business, enterprise, and activity is the idea of what you are trying to do. When that is satisfied, then you look for finance. You don't start from finance because you want to be. So finance here is secondary. That's something that I wanted to uh, emphasize here. That finance is not the first consideration. It's kind of a, I was even uh, uh, making a joke of finance uh, to a guy, a colleague, uh, who is uh, one big shot in the finance ministry uh, in Kampala. I said, I think we should change uh, this level of the Ministry of Finance, Planning, and Economic Development. Because you start finance, and when you get the money, you spend it and you take the money, you spend it and take the money before you do planning. It should be, you start with planning, and you know what to do, what to plan, get the plans, and then you prioritize. This is first tier, the second tier. It's when, maybe when the money runs out, I want to do this. And then it is when you move to, to finance, as second. And then the economy develops. So I said, why don't you change this to Ministry of Planning, Finance, and Economic Development? Of course, I know that he doesn't have the power to change it, but there is idea. It's an idea. He can work on it. He can work on it. Now, let me end with some takeaways. The first is that um, I think the country framework, country benchmark should be clear. A benchmark. I'm talking about benchmarks because I compare these benchmarks across countries. So it's not kind of you're going to specifically compare all the countries, all the countries in Africa, with Asia, Latin America, and other countries. And I think what we learn is that the full, free and full access to quality education, the word quality there, it has to be both quantitative change and qualitative change. Many schools are available, free and fair, but also quality of education changing. COVID, COVID has destroyed the quality of education throughout the world. It's not in Uganda phenomenon. Okay. In industrial countries, in the UK and the US, the, 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 the parents would be fighting with the children to get access to computer and the land because the parent has to keep the job, but the computer cannot access, and then, of course, there's only one computer. So COVID has affected this, but there has to be country, framework, country benchmarks on what they mean. What we are lacking um, is a benchmark a, that can compare countries and award, award in terms of financial access. Okay. Award countries, especially my previous employer, the African Union Banking, they are putting money in education. We never used to put money in education. Now they put money in education. If you ask this, they have to follow to see whether, quantity, whether the quality of education in the country is changing and in terms of being able to kind of support. So there have to be benchmarks. Below benchmark, you should worry. And civil society should then, of course, get the change. The second point is to take away is that education has to provide both knowledge and skills through continuous professional training, through internships. In fact, I think in many countries, in some countries in Africa, almost every country in Asia, when you, first, when you finish your first degree, as you do at the end of this week, the second stage is to look for internship. Internship, they don't pay you. You don't get a salary from internship. What you get is something that can help you start your business. You see, when you finish your degree, even if I, uh, yeah, I don't have a million dollars, but if I knew somebody that would give you a million dollars, starting a business can be a problem. Because, say, there are basic factors. How do you hire people? How do, you, how do you work? Can you be punctual and make sure that by 8 o'clock you are on the job? Or maybe 7 30 before everybody arrives. Okay. When you have worked for many years, as most of other people have here, then it becomes part of your routine. They say 8 o'clock, but you have to be there by 7 o'clock anyway. Okay. So these are some of the things. How do you hire and how do you fire? How do you discipline uh, you know, the employers? How do you look for markets? How do you get transactions? So by internship, you learn some of these tricks of the job. You watch people, what people are doing. And that's, I think, starting a, point, starting a business should be part of that internship. Internships are so critical. It's a two-way process. A, universities make MOUs with organizations to enable them to open their graduate internships. But also government may support that scheme of internship. 
It's just uh, there. I think in many countries, for example, in London, it is almost that you can't get a job unless you have an internship. So internship becomes a very important process and it teaches you, if, what it teaches the young people is uh, also an element of uh, self-discipline. Okay. In other words, you, 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 know, you can't quarrel to work even if you don't like somebody. You have to put in a smile and match on. Okay? <laughs> so that's some of the things you learn as you are. So internship teaches you some of those things. You shadow. The greatest internship actually, which could be created, um, I found a project called Mawazo in Kenya. What Mawazo does is create internships uh, for uh, young ladies uh, graduating from university with undergraduate masters and even a PhD, but they attach them to the powerful ladies emerging in the country. It's a prime minister, minister, permanent secretary, and you work in the office. Even if you are there just to make a cup of coffee, it is a lot you learn by watching, even by coming close up her and saying, how are you, madam, and so forth. You learn a lot. And by her even recognizing you, how are you since here this morning? So that kind of internship can be arranged. And all we are doing with Mawazo is to give them some funding. It's cost about, it's about, um, cost about $50,000 in the organization that I, I take part in. And that takes them internship, just targeting a young people to, especially on the, because of the disparity um, 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 in gender opportunities. So these are one of the opportunities of, um, um, the, I have I thrown it out again? Okay. So I was tired of it. Okay. Um, supporting the entrepreneurship ecosystem uh, is not possible straightforward argument because it's an ecosystem that addressing one part is not enough. If you address finance, you can address finance. You could create, say, I'm going to create a, um, a um, $60 million through the Uganda Development Bank to support young entrepreneurs. But the finance is not alone. It has to be an ecosystem. All the factors have been put in place, especially the growth of the private sector, which is a big engine for growth. The role of a side sector NGO for boosting education, especially by creating awareness, by enabling younger people to, to, to form clubs. And maybe I can give a, um, a, an example here. I think uh, one, of the, um, one of the big changes in the, um, in the catering industry right, has been the creation of groups. I don't know where they are here, like um, Uber Eats. A, um, this is that, especially because of COVID and even before COVID, you don't have a chance to go to the restaurant and have lunch. What you do, you order for food online and you get the food delivered to your house. Normally very cheap, actually cheaply. And the people that have actually taken off this route are the young entrepreneurs. They work on border border, they use some of them work in bicycles, uh, and basically they then uh, um, create food in various big kitchens, and they thus distributing at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Now, these are rated in London, and one of the top seven was created by young um, undergraduates who used to live in one hall, okay, seven of them, and they formed that company. They formed that company of what they said, what dishes do people want? What dishes would they want for breakfast, dishes for lunch, dishes for dinner? They form a company, they then make an order online and distribute, starting with very few people, and then they expand, and now they are rated one of the seven, which means basically they are running now in two millions of pounds expansion. Brave ideas, and maybe it didn't start, or they maybe started and floated, then the floor, but they have been able to do it in just a space of about two years. 
So this is very important to see that LDH as an example of giving young graduates doing jobs and also being able to take advantage of the growth in the private sector. And I'm ending up with the mobility of labor. What has driven all the economies of the world since the Second World War in 1945 has been the commitment that the factors of capital money will move free around the world with an obstruction, and that labor will move freely around the world. It is in a classical economics, free movement of the factors of production, labor and capital. Capital is moving okay around the world, although we in African countries have strong limitations on how much capital we can get. But labor is not. Labor is not. At the global level, it's very difficult to move labor and work in most of the industrial countries. Even at the regional level, even when we form organizations like Comesa, East African Community, I think a strategy that it's a, it's a, a tragedy that capital mobility and labor mobility is not 100% perfect. There should be what is called perfect capital mobility and perfect labor mobility. I hope that uh, uh, efforts, concentration trying to achieve perfect capital, uh, perfect capital mobility and perfect labor mobility will work because it allows for great specializations. It allows also for a combination. When you are forming companies, you could have a company in which two of the shareholders are Kenyan, in which two are Ugandans, two are Tanzanians, two are Rwandans, and that way then you have a great good distribution of formation of enterprise. And you have then individuals being able to move from one country to another, just of course observing the laws, but not necessarily being blocked uh, into a, some work permit kind of arrangement for six months or never being able to move. And so all we say here in the connection about the three is employment, uh, education, entrepreneurship, employment does depend a lot about is labor, is human capital mobile, or is it only domiciled within the borders of the country? Thank you very much. I think I can end on this point. And Ladies and gentlemen, the mood is always that we must stand up and give a professional applause for the speaker. And we clap hands seriously and we say thank you. <laughs> we can take our seat. The speaker has given uh, what for us sometimes we call it epistemology, and I think a paradigm shift of now thinking amongst our students is really at the point. I hope we've learned, and we can hear from me I've been learning. I like entrepreneurship. I always tell Sister Doctor, I think now you have got the guru here in entrepreneurship, and I think that's the way to go. I'm always on time. That's my problem. And if you kill time, then you cannot get entrepreneurship working, and you may even lose employment. At this juncture, I kindly request the Dean Rose to rise up and receive the book and the gifts given by Professor Mirinde. Most of them are in entrepreneurship and in that bias, so that you can take them to where they belong, to the Dean of, of Business and Social Science. So, I think the Vice Chancellor will help our professor from the DVC to give the books to Rose and you give them to Sister Dr. Priska because they belong to that very faculty. Sister, you may rise up to receive your books because it's a gift to the university and you are the custodian of that knowledge. So she will carry them. That's why I picked her, she's strong enough carry the knowledge to the bank. So there are various books, but they belong more to the faculty of business and social sciences. So professor, on behalf of your sister, I have not given a chance to speak, 
we are thankful. Knowledge is always written in the book. At this juncture, you can take it to the professor. We are going to open discussion, and I'll ask Father Charis, who is going to be helping us to pass the microphone, so that questions and dialoguing and discussion can take about 30 minutes, at, at most. Because we want to be prompt on, at, at five, so that we can go to prepare for the day. So Father Charles, uh, you will have to pass the microphone, which are how many? Professor, we will ask, we allow how many questions, or how many discussions, or remarks? As many as you have. Time will limit us, and then we'll see how we do it. So you raise the hand, the microphone will go to you. You ask questions, but those who wish to come and be here because we are live, you can come forward and give your remarks or your additions to the knowledge that has been given to us. We are all learning because even the professor is here to learn from the students and from the mass which is here. So at this juncture, may I, may I request that those who are ready, you can put up the arm and then we eye you and then you come. So, Father, I think you, you can come forward and give a comment or you want to speak from there. Fine. Father Charles. No, we shall request him to come here because we are on the radio. Fine, fine. Let him come forward. You could even use this one where I'm standing so that you can go online. So, Father, you can use this one. Professor uh, Thank you very much for this global lecture, uh, which has enlightened us. My comment is about the culture, change of culture, psychological culture, which is needed to change the minds of the parents, of their children, education service providers, members of parliament, the cabinet, or I should say the government, and students, particularly after their basic degree. This subject, entrepreneurship, is relatively new in Uganda. And it's not appreciated enough. But what is required is probably not a subject, but a module, um, a unit in the education system that would be taught at all these levels, parental, primary, secondary, education, uh, university, and so on. How can this be implemented if you consider as you implied, that it is a basic need. Okay, should I come there? Yeah, okay. 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 Yeah. So I'm, I'm protecting uh, our professor, so he'll answer all the questions later. He's noting, so that we can have three, four in order to, and we are going to use this side. Uh, in line with what the previous speaker has said, there is a tendency of our learners after their degrees, which, which I also call psychological thinking, whereby they look at their degrees and then compare the entrepreneurship part of engaging in something not related with what they studied. I don't know how you enlighten them there to change that psychological thinking and know that they can incorporate their degrees together with um, other aspects that can develop them and actually bring on what we call career growth and personal growth. Thank you. We have more questions. More questions, graduates. You come forward. Those who want to ask questions, line up and you come, you come forward so that we quickly do it. 
we shall allow this first batch. My question is, I'm a graduate. I've graduated from the University of St. Joseph. And I would like to know, we are facing uh, uh, an employment problem in our country. You reach in a company, they want you to pass the market for it so that you can get that opportunity to get employed. So I would like to know what, what uh, are the strategies are they willing to offer for us so that we can be capable as a pioneer student of the University of St. Joseph to be marketable in the employment world? Thanks so much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for the wise words. Um, Ivan Mohanji. A seminarian at the Chair of Vocation Center Seminary. Uh, my question is, uh, among the issues to curb unemployment in Uganda has been the issue of SMEs or small medium enterprises. I would like you, Professor, to brief us some of the tips about the SMEs. Thank you very much. I thank you, Professor. I'm called to Moise Deus from Chela Vocation Center. Uh, in your notes, you talked about market chain. And uh, I would like to ask uh, to the students who are graduates, a graduate who has finished his or her studies and um, would like to take up a uh, an entrepreneurship venture instead of searching for jobs. And someone is broke, has finished the university, has got no money, but would like to take up a, an entrepreneurship venture. How can one start? And then we talk about the market chain so that someone can prosper. I thank you. Thank you, Professor Mlingo. I am Amanya Abel, a student at the University of St. Joseph in Barara. My query is all about, I heard of you talking about political freedom in relation to entrepreneurship. How can African countries, and Uganda in particular, promote entrepreneurship without foreign investment, relying on local investment? Thank you. Thank you very much, our professor. Protocol Bezavid. I'm Triamsima Federico Fred from University of St. Joseph Marara. Uh, my concern here is on market size. Because sometimes we, we, we enter in sub projects, but you find you can't get where to sell your products. And maybe even this education system we are in now, we are creating an educated, we are creating educated and employment. So maybe if you can talk of how we can solve manpower, poor manpower problem. Because if we, we plan for, we plan for the available jobs, at least there we can solve this problem and we get how we can be employed. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Victor Mrinde, for the nice teachings you have told us. It's been worth digesting. My name is Eugene Nwamanya, the good president of the University of St. Joseph. And my query is about uh, how can we implement entrepreneurship at a young stage? Because if we are to see, uh, we see uh, it is not implemented uh, when these uh, students or people are young. 
we are only targeting to ambush them when they are old and when they are taken up by other ventures. Hence, this has led to the a loss of motivation. You find people are coming into entrepreneurship when they are old, just as an alternative, but without the love from young. So I want to know, uh, in the spirit and honor of Charity Begins at Home, how best can we put this, how best can we plan this into the minds of the young? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm called Mogisha Jim Jr. I'm a business student, a pioneer student, and a graduate. Thank you, Professor, for this wonderful lecture. I've really learned a lot. Uh, my question is, now that we are, we are done with the theoretical part of our studies as graduates, I would like to know which industrial sector tends to naturally promote small-scale businesses and entrepreneurship and has low barriers to market entry. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Victor, and uh, our distinguished guests. I'm Robert Friday, and a uh, pioneer student at University of Saint Joseph. I'm coming to graduate. I am going to ask you th very, like three questions. As we are coming to graduate, we have seen most of the officials overstaying in the planning institutions. They are, stay, they are overstaying in, in leadership. I'm not talking leadership of politics, but as well as leadership of institutions. Kindly, we could ask you maybe to, to, to give an advice, because most of us, we are coming for those positions. And these people <laughs> are overstaying in those leadership positions. Kindly, how shall we overcome this? Because we are currently seeing this in Uganda. It's becoming a tire speed. And actually, most of the graduates in most of the institutions, they are over a thousand. And secondly, in most of the developing countries like Uganda, we are basically totally disturbed by Kito Kidogo. Every office you're going, people are asking for money. And I believe in this house, if 90% of us, we are at the panel, we are trying to interview people for jobs. I believe 90% we could be asking for key to Kidogo. Oh, how shall we overcome this? The third is the song of the day that has come across, I think, the world. Corruption. Everyone is corrupt. Actually, to, 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 to the saddest moment, even the kids in their families, they are corrupt. Like you, a leader who has already taken a state, who have moved across the MDCs, the most developing countries, what policies can be undertaken to overcome corruption? I submit. Thank you so much, Mr. Professor. My name is Solomon Amot. For mom here, talk about talents. I'm a songwriter, a singer, and an actor. And when you go there in the public, Many parents and many people don't support their children when it comes to talent. They see singing, acting, and dancing as if someone is not a good person. But for me, I want to tell the parents and those people who are here, you support your children as we have seen in entrepreneurship and employment. When a child is talented, that can be a way of being employed. And for me, I have my new song called Never Lose Hope. You can go on YouTube and look for it in the names of Solomon Amot. Thank you. Thank you very much, our professor. 
just want to first apologize down because I got an injury, but uh, for good, by God's grace, the brain is not injured. So me, I work with insurance. I happen to be a pioneer guild president of University of St. Joseph, and I do sales with insurance. So the challenge I have, I have encountered as a salesman, and I'm very passionate about what I'm doing, is rejections. So I really request you to guide me, and maybe I'll also guide the people who are following me about how to handle rejections in sales. Secondly, when it comes to jobs, you realize that when you go to an office and you apply for a job, they will always ask you, how, when, for how long have you worked? Experience. So we the pioneers of University of St. Joseph, this is the first graduation ever that will happen. And, you re and when we apply for jobs, they always ask us, which experience of work do you have? So I request that you guide us that when we apply for jobs, how, can, how we can answer that question? Because we have not worked anywhere. We are the first pioneers. We are graduates. Sincerely speaking, if you ask me how the experience of work I have, I will not answer. So you request that you guide us on how we can answer that question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. I'm Edwin Busa uh, from University of Rwanda, uh, College of Education, um, completing my PhD in uh, Chemistry Education. Um, I was really following up your uh, seminar, and I was really curious to know whether this entrepreneurship we're talking about, does it not link to some culture? Because sometimes we may even uh, think people saying, like, uh, all the time people are talking us about uh, entrepreneurship, they are employed. Uh, and they, they are the ones with some fun to start uh, running some business. Why don't they just do something so that we can see it? Again, um, as I'm talking about um, science education, I'm going to, uh, sometimes there is even my third saying like teachers, they, they normally they are poor. Teachers, they are always poor. They don't have these um, ideas of really engaging in uh, some business so that they can uh, see starting some some job some um, place some job. I just want to know whether uh, if these things of entrepreneurship you 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 less uh, an important things like saying like with this globalization we are getting some new curriculum we are revising curriculum to meet the 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 the, 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 the market's requirement. Uh, you highlighted some of the new uh, subject or new. Um, uh, degrees which are offered because of this new globalization. I would like to know whether uh, whether is this um, entrepreneurship we are talking about is really uh, something for us as Africans uh, which we can um, really invest in uh, because I, I always see people we are fearing. Uh, to, the ones with a job, is, he doesn't want to, to move. He just want to keep it. Uh, what can we do uh, especially um, having that method, even our teachers, to, to make sure that they are even training uh, students uh, to be able to be entrepreneur in the future. I don't um, um, just stop it without calling you all of you here to visit Rwanda to see what um, we are doing, our progress, and uh, even keep um, sharing the. As East Africans, you see uh, uh, soon RDC uh, join the East African to see what we can do together as East Africans. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor. I'm called Katwin Emmanuel, businessman, and uh, an interest as a person in skilling. I like skilling the youth for hands-on skill. But uh, among the presentation, what I discovered, the capital, the problem as you presented, most of the things we are failed by capital, we have always tried to source in PSFU, uh, it's slow, 
Ruby in Kampala. Because that is the easiest mode of joint main organizations. The capital is always the problem. In terms of, and, uh, of I would expect, uh, I'm asking about to, are you, where are the applications for the cushioning of the post COVID cushioning? So that we move at the same pace. Because those countries you, miss, you talked about, they have low interest rates. And our businesses are done online. So that means we may get in the cocoon of being offside. Because the other ones will apply online, probably they are used and they succeed. And when you come here, even our students get challenges of cyber, cyber coning, which also limits them. So I think all in all, I would expect that we get this cautioning of the COVID. I read about the IMF is trying to put in, but uh, as universities, you can see how we can rob for a lot. That's my input that I'm looking at, and also how to mitigate the, the cyber crime to interest those students. Because they waste a lot of time, nothing is done, hands-on skills is not done, then we keep in the same cocoon. And my mindset, mindset said also takes long, the social policy norm. It takes long, yet we are now moving in the first world. So how do we survive to patch up and succeed so fast? Thank you very much. I think let's have a final for the first round, okay? Thank you, Professor. I'm called Atwanjir Francis, and I would like to ask you, Mr. Professor, you have said that entrepreneurship is, uh, is as a result of education. But in Uganda, education, it is now becoming a problem. Because due to rampant increase in fees, so you find that you are a parent, you have six children, and you have taught that child from at the age of three years. Then by the time he graduates, that person, he or she is around 21. And that age, in that age bracket, after that, at, after that person has finished graduating, you find that he or she he has no starting capital to start a business. Mr. Professor, I want you to help us. How can you start a business when you have already finished your school? When you when at home? When you have already sold all the properties, investing in it, investing in education. <laughs> then another thing is that in developed countries, country heavily invest in research and development. As an entrepreneur, how ca how can I how can I use such a research? to develop my business. Thank you. I think, Professor, the questions are pertinent. They are across from students, graduates, and, uh, of course, business fellows. So it's your time now either to use a podium, if you fit, because you can do some exercise, or if you feel you can stand, we bring a microphone. But if you can do some simple exercise and answer the questions, and of course uh, the gestures and the movements and the stresses of your gestures are good. Somebody was saying you really, that smile makes them feel it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Let me first uh, thank uh, uh, all these people that um, have generated um, uh, these questions. And uh, the fact that uh, we've gathered uh, exactly 15 questions uh, means that um, uh, we have all taken a great interest uh, in the discussion and that uh, this is the feedback. 
I, I really um, asked about being engaged and um, uh, having an interactive uh, kind of discussion. And this is just testimony that actually it is of great interest and the feedback is all great. So I thank you very much. Those who have asked the questions and those who were ask, thinking about the same questions but didn't want to repeat asking the same questions that come here and just because these have been covered by other people. Um, yeah, I think uh, uh, Father Boniface, your observation is very accurate. Uh, your question about the change in the culture and the implementation of this uh, is so uh, critical. And, and what we learn from this is basically uh, that it's the seriousness, it is the articulation of what a budding entrepreneur, in other words, an entrepreneur that's coming up and starting, even thinking about entrepreneurship, their preparedness to be able to deal with uncertain uncertainties. Businesses is uncertain. Uh, and in fact, there is a relationship between business uncertainty or business risk and profitability. And it requires a lot of patience. It is part of the training of entrepreneurship to be able to access the risk, mitigate it and by dealing with it. And that means that the cultural um, uh, development of the person is, the, the cultural development is not about the um, national culture, it's about the actually attitudes and psychological behavior of the entrepreneur in terms of dealing with unexpected and the preparedness mentally and otherwise and behavior to be able to engage with the uncertain and continue enterprising, okay? So, a, uh, for example, um, when you talk to some of the successful entrepreneurs on the African continent, like Dangote, who ran the cement industry all over Africa, he had a lot of business uncertainties when he was starting up. He had a lot of challenges, but the fact that one business goes under does not mean that you actually gave up in uh, what you are trying to do. It means you do some learning, the monitoring, evaluation, learning, that you can actually have this is the culture of being able to adopt and take on board new challenges and think of another way you can. If, for example, um, the business was a one person band, a one man band, a one woman band, then it may well be the case that you need partnerships. You need to take on board people with different skills where they can weigh in, people with different attitudes and skills who can work with you in partnership and as a team deliver the company. It also may be the case that you need to save that company. In fact, I think young graduates, for example, knowing some of the um, experiences uh, uh, in, the, in the UK, those who leave, for example, university and they are working in environmental sciences and they stay, start some farms, is that some entrepreneurs test up the farm in order to sell it, not for it to continue. They do registration once it comes off, we are able to be able to sell it. You are watching a HTD. So this again is the culture of preparedness and being able to move in and out of the market. And there was also a question about a, um, a degrees and career growth and then personal growth. I think uh, they did. Uh, I think actually that's fundamentally important uh, because it may well be the case that for an individual, say a graduate of St. Joseph, those are getting the degrees uh, this week, it may be that your career or your experience will be hovering between entrepreneurship and maybe working for other career trends. It may be you start with um, going into careers and then end up being an entrepreneur. The reason I say this is that it has been well documented that for most entrepreneurs that have started a innovative cafes, you have a cafe where they sell just simply coffee and tea, but somebody comes in with another dimension of special coffee with something added. It's because they have actually gone and worked on a, a, a coffee shop for maybe six months, one year, trying to see what is actually, what, what is operating in the coffee shop and thinking about how they could do it better. Some people even have started working on those small jobs because maybe in Uganda, you may think that it is demeaning to finish your degree and work in a coffee shop. But in many countries, this is standard. When those individuals go to work in a coffee shop, 
They know they are not going to work in a coffee shop forever. They know they want to learn the world of the trade and then see how they can go to from there. Sometimes there is what they call holding jobs. Okay. So maybe you finish your university and then you work somewhere temporary for six months to find a way of looking around until you get a, a, a perfect job. And, and I think that maybe, although my experience is many years out of date, I think that within a period between uh, when we completed exams in June and by the end of December, I had changed three jobs. Okay. That's because I could never be satisfied with one of them anyway. Okay. So they, it may be that in building your career, you may want to try jobs and change and getting opportunities, try them. But that's, uh, that's one way of uh, you know, career path changing. Actually, at the end of the day, 10 years later into whatever you're doing, whether you are uh, an entrepreneur, you have a strong CV of having ever tried various dimensions. Your experience is not tied to one dimension. You have worked in a coffee shop. You have uh, maybe um, a, a provided um, a worked in a restaurant. And that is tied to another question, maybe kind of jumping of um, how do we get on the job market, on the job ladder? One, of course, as I mentioned, is internship. But the other is when the employer is asking you, what is your experience? They know you have just completed a degree at St. Joseph. Right? So they know you have not been working for 10 years. But what they would like to know is whether after your O levels, after your senior form, whether you did some jobs. Okay. And how you got in with whatever little job you did. They want to know also after your A levels whether you are trying to do something or just sitting at home. They want to know also within your years at university whether you were engaging in some kind of activity, even if it is volunteering. In many industrial countries, volunteering is a big thing. People go to volunteer, not because they are to volunteer, but to come up with something. People, some young people run marathons, not because they want to run marathons, but to demonstrate to any person hiring that they have stamina. Because in a marathon, it is not that you want to come fast. You possibly come number 24 or number 40. But you complete. That's endurance and stamina. So there are some aspects that employers will be looking for. That's why when you wrote down, when you write down that um, you worked um, after you worked for three months uh, in a cafe or in a restaurant as a waiter, right? Part of it is how you are able to engage with the customers and how you're able to take the fatigue of serving 100 customers in one evening. That is a skill that you learn. And so it's not surprising that in many OECD countries, every person by before they go to university, they have worked in a restaurant or a coffee shop or some sort and were engaging with some, some any job, including, as I mentioned, volunteering where you can some volunteer. You can volunteer in the church, you can volunteer in an organization, but volunteering is a way of commitment to the cause, where there's a cause for volunteering, and the way of adapting, working as, as a team, working with other people, without necessarily uh, knocking them down or making life impossible for them, which is one of the skills that the, uh, the employers are looking for, and one of the skills of entrepreneurship. Um, um, a, a strategy, a strategy is, um, a, as a, a pioneer, yeah, I think this is actually a very, very important way of, um, 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 of um, a designing strategies and especially a designing strategies um, a, to be marketable, a, to be able to advertise yourself. Um, the, the part of it could be part, um, there are some, for example, degree structures that have, um, a, they, call, they call them sandwich programs. At one time, I think about 10 years ago, they used to be popular, popular in the UK, whereby they would redesign um, a three-year program to run for three or six months, a building in a couple of months, working in two industries. I know that, for example, uh, in some of the universities I work with in China, where I have my partners, it is almost standard in uh, uh, China, in Suzhou's and others, that the universities are linked to um, the councils, uh, the city and the municipals, in which basically they are involved in their program. Okay. But I have also seen 
undergraduates who are enterprising uh, at the University of Birmingham, where I worked for about 20 years, uh, the students formed the Museum of Zunte Club. They formed the same two uh, student societies. And one of these student societies was to do investments, taking about a, a 10 pounds, um, a, a working on the stock exchange. They ended up at the end of the year that they had already big a windfall of profits, which they had declared they would not share, but they would be used to demonstrate they can do something. So you can even form societies. You have society, I think you have societies like Joseph. These societies could be on something, it would be, uh, uh, but it's a way of demonstrating to any enterpreneur, inter, inter, uh, any employer, or in a way of bringing up an entrepreneurial spirit of working on something and making it work. Uh, so those societies can uh, play um, an important role. Um, yes, entrepreneurship, uh, relying on local investment. I would say actually, um, yes and no. The reason for diversification of um, equity and ownership in a company, in a company ownership, basically you are looking at the total funding of a company. If you have a company, say, a small company, say, was, say, a 1,000 pound small company, then you have the structure of ownership. It is one person who puts in 20%. There are other people who put in 20%. Together as a team, you own that company. You have the equity stake for that company. Sometimes you, even if it's small, medium enterprise, a small one you are starting with, you are allowing in for my friend here, the businessman, because he's going to bring in some ideas and some of the skills on working with happen. One of the local black people in Birmingham who got an a Queen's Award Basically, all he does is just work with the um, um, uh, work with the McDonald. McDonald sell a lot of fast food, burgers and chips and all this stuff. And what he does is basically work with franchises. He goes to McDonald. He says they want to open a shop here. Of course, they give them the parameters. They give him all the money, set up the shop, but they give him how much he has to earn on a daily basis how many burgers he can sell on a daily basis. And he works hard to advertise among students, among people, among workers and so forth, to be able to, uh, to, to do that. So he, there is that basically, he has not put in his, uh, his money, he's doing a franchise, but he has to, all businesses do franchises, and I'm sure that in, in here in Uganda, you have some international businesses that can do franchise, especially for young people that want franchise, because they know they work around the clock, they don't run out of steam. Okay, so franchising could be one, but the reason why you are taking on other investors is because it's not only you want their money. No, money actually is not a big consideration in working as a partner. Maybe you want their skills. Maybe you want their market. And for in international investors, to me, the reason why they could be uh, partaking in that um, um, SMEs is because they can allow growth. They may have a technology which they can put into the book. They may also enable you access to markets that you cannot access way on your own. And those are some conditions. But you have to evaluate them. In other words, you don't have to take them, but just one. You have to have an implicit because of why you think this factor is important and how you're going to evaluate that these people are going to deliver on their word. Okay. So, um, uh, I think, um, yeah, there was a uh, from um, uh, Mujisha about the um, industrial sector providing um, uh, entry. So the industrial sectors, uh, if you look at, say, um, uh, industry, uh, you can get industrial classifications also about 14 different sectors. But it may not be the sector per se because what you, your SMEs may be sitting between two different sectors. What has shown to be phenomenally growing in developing countries, including Uganda, is the services sector. Because un unlike in the, um, in the uh, product sector, you have really to innovate and show that you are producing a, a product 
which is not already in the market. Okay. And that requires a lot of what we call here uh, innovation compared to the service. Robert, you are right. This kid Kidogo kills. This uh, corruption kills. And as I said, it's a big cost to uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, there are many ways in many, in many countries how they have combated um, a, 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 a corruption, including uh, a name and shame a schemes uh, in Tanzania and in Ghana. Uh, but some of these have been the determination to be actually cut down on, and blacklist some of those corrupt practices. However, there is a problem that in some, it, it may become a culture of its own. That whatever it will do, you have got to build something. And that produces a big, big distortion. The big distortion are in prices and markets. Um, I think the, the solution is not as simple as we want it to be. A Solomon, you are already an entrepreneur. You have a market. And I, I, I say that with all the seriousness. If you see, uh, you, you possibly being a singer, you have listened to Adele, the singer. Adele is a, she's a younger person. And as you can see, when she's making all these big do's in London, the awards, what is surrounding and what is being about are black people. She's not a black person. But she grew up in the environment in a, in a secluded area of London where she was being surrounded by people. She understands where they're coming from. But what has this is the actual sheer determination for her to start. Okay. So the singing is one part. The second part is getting a label, is being able to produce that music and put it on the world map. And there will be many people who would be, who would be very, very, very prepared to do that. Okay. So you need to just start creating a network. Produce that music. Whatever you produce, share it with other people. Okay. There are people looking out for such a talent like yourself. And once you make a step, then the only thing is that put out also that some of those who are looking at that. But I think you are ridden board. There is nothing that will stop you. You may, you may trip or you may not want not to get it one second time, but definitely you will get it. It's a big, big industry. A big industry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so you already can enterprise and... Uh, oh, by the way, um, uh, again, we've had people who have gone into singing, drama, acting, even when they have two degrees. So as I said, the university gives you a basis for being able to uh, quickly absorb information and show that you have the competency. In other words, when you are doing this music, you'll be drafting your own music, you'll be making presentation to the audience, you'll be writing up, and that's the only because you have university education. Okay. So the fact that even if, say, you had read um, a, a degree in law, there's no reason why you can't sing and you just put it aside. One of the greatest musicians in this country who is a now, a, um, his music is really um, very fundamental. Okay. Uh, my friend who runs the Endere Trooper, yeah, he has a degree in economics. That's what you may not know. But he has a degree in economics, so he's a graduate with economics. But what he does is Endere Trooper. So it's the fact that whatever degree you read, you can understand you can go into where you work as well as enjoy what you are doing. And I should be able to go uh, ahead. Um, okay. Um, insurance rejection? No. Um, the insurance sector is um, is a big one, but I think that the market for insurance is not so grown in Uganda as even in the other uh, African countries, where everything uh, is insured from life insurance, mortgage insurance, business insurance. Any risk can be insured. Okay, and for uh, who asked this question? By the way, um, I thought I didn't write this name. You know, um, the basis for insurance is based on the law of large numbers. The formula is summating, and then whatever, then you distribute by number. Okay, that's how it operates. Of course, uh, it has a problem in insurance because what it, the, the the challenge with insurance in in medium and small enterprises, for example the fact that the individuals operating may not be able to pay a premium. If you pay the premium of 10,000 pounds, okay, the um, uh, individuals may be able to meet it. So what is being done in the MS and the microfinance sector especially is to invert the formula for insurance. So 
people being insured, is, uh, insured don't have pre a premium upfront. Yeah, the premium is collected at the end of the insurance. This is how, for example, we are able to design a mechanism for insurance by, coffee fa by cocoa farmers in Ghana. So we spend a lot of time in Ghana using a method called randomized controlled trials, whereby we do an experiment. We do an experiment in three stages. Year one, we write down people, their name, their characteristics, their farm, their size, and everything. Year two, we give them an intervention and open a bank account for one of them and ask them whether we can then get the bank and insuring company insure their product, even if weather comes. In stage number three, we do the evaluation to see whether the insurers have actually earned them and that it works. And then, of course, we sell the patent of that scheme. So, but insurance has worked and it is just changing the formula that you can get uh, um, banks and organizations which don't have to take premium at the front because some poor people can't afford to do that, some farmers cannot do that. But tax insurance and the end of the service being provided, which is just uh, the people designing the formula, we just sort of write the formula mathematically and then invert it, and you get the same result. Okay. Um, insurance. Ah, which one have I forgotten? Which which one did I did I pick on? A value. A. Um, oh yes, yeah, from the University of Rwanda. Very uh, very good. Uh, a, um, a uh, contribution and about a, a a science education a it's just reminded me in that question um, um uh, export of services it is not something you hear about so much okay but some of the services you may offer as a young entrepreneur may be formed as an export Okay, this is when, for example, in 2003, the organization, um, organization called ANCTAD, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, produced the yearbook. And if you check that, wherever you find that, this was written by a guy called Victor Marini. What we are trying to do, right? is to understand whether there is export of services by graduates of given universities. Let me give you an example. Doctors graduate from universities here around Uganda. They don't go into hospitals to work. They get a loan, a simple loan, or support from an organization they start out their own clinic. They offer services. And what happened in that report where I'm documenting is where the doctors are not coming from one country. The doctors, Kenyan doctors, work with Ugandan doctors and one doctors, they form a clinic with an office in each country. That's phenomenal. They have made it. It's an export. They are exporting medical services to those and identified these services, medical services, they don't have to look for a job in a hospital. Pharmaceutical services, the pharmacy product. Lawyers and in, the, in the legal practices. Architects in those services. It could also be just simple consultancy. It could be journalism, producing news for online products or for newspapers. Online products is much more marketable because you can do that at home and sell it in a um, business. So it shouldn't stop you from looking out there, using social media, identify people in another country, and export services. That's a part of, the, uh, of uh, that, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, okay. Um, uh, networking, that is okay. And uh, Francis has something. Yes, uh, how do you face? No research and development. Uh, it's a challenge. But I still think, convinced personally, that starting a business and entrepreneurship is not about finance. I know it appears counterintuitive, okay. But it's not about finance. Initially, it's about the idea, you know, what you are trying to do. What SMEs are you trying to do? Are you trying to do an MSME of a small business that you saw your friend doing, or you saw your uncle doing, or you have heard about? 
So this morning I was having a conversation on the phone. I was driving down from Kampala to Mbarara. Somebody who wants to start a, a cottage industry from home, manufacturing nails and supplying nails to some certain outlets, right? But then when you ask some certain simple questions, have you done a market survey to know how many nails you can be able to sell per month? No. Do you know whether there is such a demand for these nails? Yes, I see some people selling nails. Okay. And do you know what it will cost you to get um, a simple machine for nails? You can get a simple machine from China, okay, which can actually do that at the back of your home. But have you identified it from China? Can you show that you have identified three machines and you are choosing one, even when they are online? You can click online now in Google and identify this in, in China for this which can manufacture that. But you need to first get these three and then compare them to be able to decide one. Maybe you are buying one of a capacity of one million nails a day when you only want 10 nails you know, a day, something like that. So the background information of an idea, convince yourself that it is workable before you get somebody's money. Whether the money is your uncle, or whether the money is the bank, or whether the money is got from some other, just convince yourself that the idea is entrepreneurial. Stage number one, like in the old dancing lessons, when you used to do stage one and stage two, right? If you just start with stage two, you start, you start to, you know, knocking your partner's dancing shoes off. So do stage number one, identify the idea. Stage number two, then look for finance. But the fact that you know for sure that there is no finance, but that's not an insurmountable problem. Insurmountable. Once some people take on ideas, I'm sure that if you had a discussion with the idea to the businessman here, my friend, he's supposed to tell you, oh, actually, what well, the idea you're mentioning, I've not had it before. I've not had anybody you know, talking about this. Uh, and where are you going to sell the products? Okay. And then, of course, when the idea has been fermented, you need to have a documented, a, um, you need to have documentation for legal ownership of the idea. You need the documentation that this is your idea. For example, when you are producing the music, you need ownership, the copyright ownership of that. For any of the books that are given to the dean, there is copyright that this book will not be in the book, uh, they have copyright of that. So there will be that protection of ownership. You know, protection of ownership will be idea, protection of ownership, and then finance. Because when you go to finance, you say, is that idea yours? Yes. Can that, that idea be copied? If you have an idea, it's good, but it can be copied, they won't give you the money. Because they will finance you and then everybody else will copy it. And then, of course, the project will not fail. So there are some of the key elementary issues that you have to do. But whatever happens, I think those who want to go into entrepreneurship, now that you have degrees, you are entrepreneurs. Thank you. You have uh, another clap, because the professor has elaborately done it. One of uh, our managers taught me how to manage time. Associate uh, Nice Gold, Reverend Father, Associate Doctor. Somebody taught me how to do that. So in this time, I'm going to manage time properly. At this juncture, I wish to invite the Vice Chancellor to give us closing remarks. And then we have a closing prayer, and then we call it a day. And the closing prayer will be led by Reverend Father Deosteli Tibukenya. He's a minister. And I'm happy to note, Father, before you give a speech, that he's interested in the university. You remember how he has done it. And I hope, Father, we invite you to attend. So don't attend only this one. Also attend the function of the graduation. So, Father, you can uh, make the closure and then we see how we move on. On behalf of the University of St. Joseph Mbarara, 
I want to take this opportunity to thank Professor Victor for the public lecture that you have given to this audience. Let us clap for the professor. I am confident that the participants have gained a lot from your presentation, and I'm sure they are especially the pioneer, group, uh, pioneer graduates uh, will make use of the knowledge that they have learned to be entrepreneurs and get themselves jobs. Uh, thank you, Professor, for accepting to be part of the University of St. Joseph as our visiting professor uh, for the University of St. Joseph. And he has told me that he, he will not leave this country until he has seen the first graduation of the university. He will be present for the graduation, after which he will visit the library. Maybe he will see what we need. Later, I think he will do the needful when he goes back to London. So we have, we have a very powerful partner for the development of the university. Our graduates and the continuing students must be anxious about getting jobs. I think that is the right one. And I've been really been pleased by the attendance of our students. The attendance has been very, very good. So our interaction with you, Professor, opens ways for, for partnership with the University of London and other organizations that you work with and those that you have worked with. You have traversed the whole world, you have a lot of exposure. I want that uh, your presence or your partnership or your friendship with us uh, paves the way, especially for the young people, especially in the area of employment. I would seek that they get your contact, either email or what, so that they can write to those who can go graduate, they, or even before they write to you, direct them. Maybe some of them want to go to South Korea, others want to go to America, others want to go anywhere. So I don't want to see these students on the street and I meet them and they tell me, I'm, the university, I'm a product of the University of St. Joseph. I want all of them to be in employment as soon as they graduate. I would also use, use my also wherever I am to send a message, are you okay? Um, some adverts and say where, so that students can get uh, jobs. So we need to help our, and guide our graduates and students uh, to get jobs as soon as they get out of the university. So thank you very much, Professor, for, for loving us, uh, flying all the way from Europe to Uganda, and especially honoring our invitation for the public lecture. I, I want to recognize important people in this audience that have contributed to the University of St. Joseph. Some of you are very young, you have not seen how, you, you don't know some of these important people. One of them is the first person that came to uh, ask a question or comment, is the Reverend Father Boniface Zabazungu. He's the one who mooted the idea of starting University of St. Joseph. The first one, Father Zabazungu, stand up and these young people see you. So if he was not around, maybe you have been somewhere else. But he's the one who said, we must start a university on Nyamtanga here. <laughs> then Reverend Father, Bukenya Deus Dedit is one of the promoters of the university. He was the one funding some of the things that were working at the university. He's there. When you go to our petrol station, you'll see him monitoring that function. <laughs> Those projects, eh? That's why I think he has come to you. <laughs> to attend this, uh, this public lecture on entrepreneurship. And the last one is uh, Mr. Pore Turambre, one of the first members of the Governing Council of the University of St. Joseph is there. <laughs> so I wish you the best of the, the, best of the day, and uh, I wish you the graduates, uh, congratulations in advance, and I wish you the best on that graduation day. Please come early and uh, attend the function uh, right away from 8 a.m. until the end. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Before we invite uh, Father Deus Dedi to give a closing prayer, kindly allow me to ask Father Charis to thank some people who have helped us do this. So, Father Charis, can you come and uh, thank our people? 
No, you thank the people. I, I, please thank our. Thank you, Dr. Barije. I just want to appreciate people who helped us to have this event uh, broadcast beyond this room. And uh, in a view, I have Radio Maria that has broadcast the event live, represented by Kaba, Kaba Funzach Tadias. Thank you. We had uh, a television online called EIT TV, which is Empower Youth in Technology TV, and represented by Henry here. We had uh, his other boss, ah, is here, Ronald. Ronald Shave is the CEO of this company that is uh, doing a lot online. Then uh, we had uh, other media representatives. We had Amosius from the Ewa newspaper. Where is Amosius? Oh, there he is. Yuhanu uh, Chumita this time to, to wants to, to partner with us. We had Koselin. Koselin is a young lady working with Good News uh, Television. It's a new television in town uh, based in uh, Kamukuzi. There was someone from Cruz FM. Is he here? I think he left. Yes, but besides that, we have Mr. Vega, who is actually covering the video and the photography for Tuesday. That was the, the match for this event and also for the graduation. Thank you, Mr. Vega. He had another colleague, very tall, I don't know whether he went. Maybe he left. Yes, he's not a short man. Can you stand up and I see you? Eh? He's as tall as Father Zabajung. Eh? Thank you. So, thank you very much. We, I don't know the feedback from the online, but there were a lot of participants on Facebook for the University of St. Joseph, on the Facebook account of Radio Maria, on the Facebook account of AIT TV, they have other channels like YouTube, all that were interacting, all those were interacting with us, Professor. So thank you very much, and we wish you the best. Thank you. I take this honor to invite Father Deus Dedi to Kenya to come and give us a final blessing to conclude this event. The students who are not of St. Joseph, I saw a student of MAST. Is she still around? Yes, welcome. Any other student from MAST who attended? That is Amosius of Iwa. The religious who came, the business community, the group from Rwanda, and all those who came, please thank you for coming and come again on Saturday. We shall welcome you. Let us rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, our Heavenly Father, at the beginning of this public lecture, you invoked and called upon you to be with us. Indeed, you have been with us. You have sent us your Holy Spirit to direct our deliberations, to be with our professor Victor who has led us into this discussion we want to thank you we want to thank you for our professor to thank you for the participants and we want to thank you for our University of St. Joseph Mbarara we want to thank you for the students and all those people who have been here during this public lecture we again call upon you to be with us, be with our graduates Saturday, be with the people who help us in this university. May you send us your Holy Spirit to direct all our actions and may this university continue to grow and protect each and everybody here, especially our professor and all the administration of the university and all the students. 
We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, thank you so much.